Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, and we are sitting down to talk about gaming's favorite subscription service, Xbox Game Pass. And right now, it's under a lot of scrutiny. Is Xbox Game Pass killing video games out here? That's the conversation right now. It's again all thanks to the Xbox Activision deal that's ongoing. Microsoft has confessed that Xbox Game Pass is cannibalizing sales. But I believe there's a gray area here that very few creators and outlets are addressing. We're honing in on one 2018 quote from Phil Spencer when there's dozens across multiple Xbox execs and inside sources. Like there's so much information out there for this conversation. In a couple of ways, I'm surprised it's going on as long as it is. So today, we're gonna dive deep on what's going on with Xbox Game Pass and is it really killing video games? So ladies and gentlemen, if you are new here, you're into Xbox news and information, consider subscribing. Let's begin with where this story all started, where gamesindustry.biz picked up a report that was ongoing from the CMA, where Microsoft does admit that Xbox Game Pass hurt sales over 12 months. So let's read. The UK Competition and Markets Authority provisional report on the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition includes an admission from Microsoft, we must emphasize that, that's putting games into its Game Pass subscription service cannibalizes sales of those titles. Quote, Microsoft also submitted that in its internal analysis shows a redacted percentage decline in base game sales 12 months following their addition on Game Pass, the CMA noted in the report now they don't put a percentage here so it could be five percent it could be 25 50 that's the part of the conversation where i'm seeing a lot of assumptions we just do not know but with this popping up gamesindustry.biz put out a quote from phil spencer in 2018 talking about forza horizon 4 this is about a year after the service dropped and i'm very surprised that other outlets who were doing re-reporting we're also re-reporting this quote, not because it's wrong, but the service and actually Phil, as he's talked about the service, have developed so much since then. There've been so many conversations since then. I'm surprised the 2018 quote is the one we're latching onto, but let's read that for the sake of conversation. And I'll read some others for you because I do cover a lot of Xbox, so it's easy for me to pick up some of these quotes. So let's go. When you put a game like Forza Horizon 4 on Game Pass, you instantly have more players of the game which is actually leading to more sales of the game, Spencer said in 2018. You say, well, isn't everyone just gonna subscribe for $10 and go play this thing? But no, gamers find things to play based on what everybody else is playing. Meanwhile, in 2021 of November, Phil Spencer said that Game Pass is sustainable and not burning cash. This was after multiple other claims from Xbox execs. And even Jez Corden has stepped out in a recent article saying, according to sources at events, that they have assert that they have asserted him that Xbox Game Pass is profitable without offering details on how that's exactly measured. Now the measurement that we do have here is that Xbox Game Pass since at least the Activision acquisition announcement of January of last year has 25 million subscribers. Meanwhile, Sony revealed in November that Game Pass has 29 million subscribers and admits that their PS Plus subscription service is behind. Because for those who don't know how and why that happened, pretty much both these companies are trying to play the weak one here. PlayStation saying, oh, they're killing us with their subscription service. We can't even compete with that. It's just too good. It's not fair. We, we can't let them have Activision. Meanwhile, Xbox is like, oh, man, they're like so far ahead of us. We, we, can't, we can't compete with them. We, we need these games from Activision. It's just that type of energy from both sides. So that's how the 29 million number popped up. We're not gonna run with that because that hasn't been officially announced, but I think you could trust it pretty heavily. We're gonna stick with 25 million. So right now we have 25 million subscribers. And the question being based off these quotes from Xbox and also in the CMA's report, are they killing games with Game Pass? Are they cannibalizing sales, thus hurting them and the potential of sequels, the potential of money being made off of them? There is a neutral ground here that people need to be aware of with this. It depends a lot on the game. And sometimes there are special cases. Let's take, for example, something like Hi-Fi Rush. This really exciting shadow drop, as you'll see here, it did top the charts on Steam briefly. That was exciting. It has over 8,000 reviews on Steam. And the game did pretty well on Game Pass on the Xbox consoles, where it was one of the top played games there for some time when it first released. So there was a burst of players for this game, and it did do very well for the type of 
maybe double-A style game, I would imagine people call it, that it is. Meanwhile, something like High on Life pops up at the end of 2022, typically when gaming is enjoying a bit of a lull, and in fact was the biggest third-party game launch for Game Pass. This is extremely exciting for them because these are two single-player games that have done monstrous numbers. But notice here the conversation for Hi-Fi Rush has been, well, it sold really well, despite the fact that it was on Game Pass from what we can tell. Meanwhile, something like High on Life, the talk was around player count, player count, player count. And that's always been consistent since even the Bethesda acquisition by Xbox. Here's what Phil Spencer said about Starfield, where he said that he wants it to be Bethesda's most played game ever. Note how Xbox never talks about sales numbers, best selling. Notice when they put out metrics, it's never amount of sales like Sony did with God of War Ragnarok, where they're like, yep, we're already at 11 million sales, which I think is like a beat your chest type of moment there. And so Xbox pounds their chest more with player numbers. Why does that matter in this conversation? Well, for many of you who watch this channel, I do think it's gonna be pretty obvious because we've had these conversations before, but apparently based off what the coverage I'm seeing online is, many people outside of the Xbox ecosystem seem kind of lost. The reality here is that it matters depending on the game and the type of announcement and the virality of it. Hi-Fi Rush and High on Life both did exceedingly well because they both enjoyed virality on the internet. TikToks, YouTube videos, social media posts, the surprise factor, etc., etc., all worked in these games' favor. It did not matter if it was single player or not. Now, speaking of which, multiplayer is where you're going to see the most benefits in Game Pass. You want to have your game in Game Pass if you are a multiplayer game because you will have that built-in starting player base. And if your monetization strategy is intelligent, you're going to make a lot of bread off of players hopping in going, well, I didn't pay for the game, so I am actually going to go buy like $20 of loot boxes. And if you have that plus a million players, you just made a ton of cash. That's obviously idealistic, and not every multiplayer game needs Game Pass, but it is more beneficial to be there if you are multiplayer or cooperative. Something we talked a lot about in 2021 and 2022, when Xbox really started to ramp up third-party day one Game Pass games, they were going into the multiplayer realm of things. But slowly over time, I'd say starting with E3 2022 during their summer showcase, they submerged themselves deeply with big day one acquisitions for games coming out within the next year, a lot of them being single player games, games like Ravenlock, Lies of P, Wo Long, and so on and so forth. All of these are single player games. Wo Long, of course, having a multiplayer component, but I digress. These are more single player focused titles. Why is that all important? Well, there's multiple ways that Xbox will approach things from their business point of view here. A lot of people just look at it as the only money you can make in this industry is through game sales. That's obviously not the case. And it's not just the other obvious case, which is, oh, multiplayer monetization. There are deals you can strike with a multitude of publishers to get your game funded. For example, let's say Plague Tale Requiem is a title that needed the extra money to get across the finish line and make the game that they wanted to make. So Xbox shows up and says, we'll put a hypothetical out there. Here's $2 million to fund the development of the game. In turn, you're going to put your game on Game Pass for at least a year. Now, of course, Asobo is maybe risking some sales here, but they get the assured money that they'll finish the game and everything afterwards is money generated. And so that is why a lot of teams are gravitating towards Game Pass and also a way. Some want to make the most amount of money through avoiding Game Pass and just doing sheer game sales. Meanwhile, what we often see are games coming to Game Pass very late. And the reason they come to Game Pass late is because they try to sell it. They see what money they can get out of the consumer. Then you strike a deal with Xbox maybe six months to a year later and they pay you for your game. Now, I imagine you'll make more if you do day one and you commit on that level, but the reality is it's different for every single game. And to me, I find it strange as someone who, by the way, does a lot of Xbox coverage that we're even concerned about this. Look, as consumers, we're eating good right now. Lots of great games are coming to Game Pass. I wanted to hang around, but I'm not concerned about the business realities of big Microsoft who has tons and tons of cash. This service should just be sustainable based off the fact that they have them 
in their back pocket. Like Xbox has Microsoft's big bank just sitting right there. And to me, I get to enjoy these great games when I want. It's up to them to figure all of that out. But I know for many of us, the logistics of it, the economics of the industry is fascinating. And the reality is it's a case by case by case by case by case situation. It doesn't have a one note answer. There is a very much gray area here. Whether you are a single player game or a multiplayer game, it depends on where you're at in development, how much more money you need. And if let's say you need 400,000 left in your development fees and they give you a million dollar deal, you spend 400,000 of that on the game. Guess what? You got 600,000 in the bank for your employees moving into your next project. Great. Like that's what it's about. If you manage your project wisely, Game Pass can be a boon for you. Now we're in a profitable state. And guess what? We haven't even sold a copy yet. That is the case for these games. So I think it just differs, especially because multiplayer games are going to benefit a ton from that exposure. It's not a guarantee. I look at something like Crossfire X, which was a complete flop and terrible game, honestly. And it came and went. And now it's being removed from the service soon. I mean, it's that type of risk reward system it's not always a guarantee that well you're here we have the built-in player base you still have to present something of quality and that's where it's tough when you're making the game and you got something of quality you're like would someone pay for this i'm of the mindset as a creative and obviously xbox needs to approve these games so you can't just say well i want to be in game pass there's much more to it than you just wanting to be there and they just take it and throw you money they have to review these games, of course, and decide whether or not it's worthwhile. I mean, that's an obvious part of the process when you look at their output. They're not just like, here's money, here's money. Yeah, sure, why not? Um, so I view it as a creative that like the best case scenario for you is to put it on Game Pass as soon as possible. Just get people talking about your game because there's so much good content nowadays that you want to have that marketing, that built-in marketing, that built-in player base so people play and talk about the thing that you spend time making. I come from the video background where I've spent hours, days, weeks, months on projects and dropped them and only like a couple thousand people have seen them. It is a horrible feeling when you spend all that time on something and you don't get anything out of it in the terms of people just seeing what you worked on. That's all that really matters to a creative to some extent before business realities kick in. So I feel like with Game Pass, you remove that, you get some assured cash, and then if the game is good, it should generate sales on its own on separate platforms. The best case scenario is if you are a multi-platform game with day one Game Pass, because you've kind of assured your cash in one area. Hopefully the marketing does its thing alongside Game Pass, where people can try things out, talk about it, and people pick it up on PlayStation, Switch. That's the best place I feel you can be in. But is Game Pass killing games? Again, I think it really depends how you look at it. I, obviously, Microsoft has admitted themselves it's going to hurt sales over time. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a pretty obvious answer. When you look at games that are in Game Pass day one, you have the option to get it for free and save yourself now 70 bucks most times. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. So, of course, over time, these sales are going to drop off just like they always do. How many games have we seen come out and then five months later end up in Game Pass? Because the sales drop off and then this is a monetization opportunity for people. Okay, let's get ourselves a bump here and get a couple hundred thousand dollars, a couple million dollars. I find it all deeply fascinating, but I think at the end of the day for Xbox, it comes down to player count. They care about player count. They don't, obviously they're a business, so they do, but they don't care so much about just raw profit, especially when you're in the investment period of a subscription service. You're trying to get people just to subscribe right now. And so, yeah, you gotta over deliver on value. This will be maybe a problem for them five to eight years from now. You can count on that. If they continue down this trajectory, continue down this path, then I think this conversation makes a lot more sense. But right now we're in the good stages, right? Where a subscription service is new. They're trying to get you on board. So they're giving it to you for a buck for three months. They're giving you these insane games, these insane deals. You know, it's all this ecosystem. They've claimed that it can last on its own. We'll see about that. But I don't think personally it's killing games in the way people think it's killing games. If anything, it's made some games possible because they've accepted Game Pass deals and they have been able to finish via the development costs and drop something for fans to enjoy. And there have been single player success stories. There have been multiplayer success stories. But yeah, I think the obvious answer is off the rip. You're probably not going to sell a ton of copies, but if it's something like Hi-Fi Rush, I look at that and shrug my shoulders and go, well, are they really not selling games or is it just about the quality of a title, the uniqueness of the title? And again, that's where I think it goes case by case by case. So there's no true one answer here. 
unfortunately for the internet, which I know likes the one true answer. And that's what I got for you. So let me know what you think about Xbox Game Pass. Is it killing games? You let me know your thoughts down below. Do you disagree with any of my arguments here? Fire away. Other than that, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Those links are in the description down below. And a big thank you to all the patrons, all the members who continue to support the heck out of the content here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.